I was just going to ask you, how, how big are you going? For example, most people have a current business, say a two-year plan, and a 10-year, which may be completely a dream. So you're current, you have numbers and statistics, your 10-year may be just exciting to talk about. Are, are, do you go with the bigger dream to try to capture everybody, or you're just trying to work a little more small scale with something tangible? Well, I'll, I'll let you guys answer first, because I've got mine. Um, I, I, this is a point that I didn't finish uh, really on one of my slides, that there was a 10 times return mention. Um, generally, angels are investing with the thought that there's going to be an exit. And this is what is meant by lifestyle business versus maybe more of a VC angel type business. I don't think we really mentioned this. Angels are looking, well, it used to be maybe three to five years, maybe with the recession, it's a four to seven year window, whatever it is, um, it varies dramatically. But they're looking for somebody to build a business and then to have an exit, whereas the business will be sold. Sometimes it goes public, doesn't do that so much anymore. Who knows, maybe that'll change. But they need a way to get their money back. And generally, it's not by getting you know, distribution slowly over time. Though there are angels out there, or there are investors out there who are willing to invest in a business. But the angel groups are really looking for an exit. So if this is something where you're going to build a business and you want to work there for the next 30 years, you know, angels may be a tricky, VCs especially, it's not an appropriate place for you to look. But they are looking for a possibility of a 10 time or more return. This doesn't mean you're guaranteeing that they're going to get 10 times their money back in five years, but they want to see that that's possible. That's what is meant by a fast growth business. And if you can't support that possibility at a very, we're talking about early stage, high risk investing. If there's not a possibility of that, why would they take such a huge risk? Because we lose our money. Six or seven out of 10 companies, we just lose all our money. So we have to have somebody that's going to do really well in order to not you know, become uh, poverty stricken over time and to be able to continue to keep doing this. So it's a story you're telling. Most don't make 10 times. The vast majority don't make 10 times. Some make two or three. Some you get your money back. Most are going to lose your money. But then you're going to have that big pop that will make the portfolio worthwhile. So that's the mindset they're coming in on. So that's what you, so you have to understand that. Also, it takes a lot of time. If you need money next month, Angels aren't a good person to really talk to. Every once in a while, somebody will come up with the money, but it takes months. So don't wait till you're desperate. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just to add a little bit to that, um, there's some statistics out there. There's a lot of reports out there that tell you what the return is for VCs versus what the angels are. But a rule of thumb is that if you invest, as I use that rule of thumb, if you invest in 10 companies, okay, I assume that eight are going to disappear. One is going to give me back my money in those 10 companies. And that last one's going to be my home run. That's where I'm going to really make out. Okay. So that's the kind of statistics that we're looking at. And whether you talk to me or John Asin, who's got some experience, or other angel investors, you're looking at that kind of risk profile. Okay. So being an angel investor, we're really you know, I call it gambling. We're really not gambling. We're making some smart decisions and informed decisions. So when, when angels approach you and get really hard-nosed about valuation, return on investment, exit strategies, and all that, they're not doing it because they want to give you a hard time. They're doing it because they know that probably seven, six of, of those investments are going to be zero. Okay, so they're really looking and hoping and praying and luck that one or two is, is going to come through and, and make a home run or, or get their money. So it's very high risk. Very high risk. Again, what they said. Um, and I think, you know, when I say know the perfect investment, <coughs> when you go to an angel group, you need to know what's going to make them say yes, right? So if you're selling me, what's going to make me say yes? And I think they've kind of, it's a little bit different for each angel group, right, or each VC group. So that's why and that can be a you know, two-hour presentation itself. But if you want to make a quick knee-jerk, what's a perfect investment? 10 to 12 times my money in three years with an exit strategy that you've already pre-selected. So if it's three years, it's probably a, some Google, let's use that as an example, is gonna come in and purchase you. So that means today you're worth a million, in two and a half, three years, you'll be worth 12 million, and Google's already expressed some interest. 
to something that you're building. That would be what I would call, oh my, I mean, you'd have the angels. If they believed everything else underneath that, right, you'd have them chopping at the bit. That's kind of what the hockey stick is, right? It's saying, we've got some sales, we've got some traction, we're just about to explode here. I think the other part of the perfect investment is a company that doesn't need money. I always, you know, I, when I used to pitch, I would always say, here's what happens if I get the money, and here's what happens if I don't. I don't like to invest, um, I know Mario and I, we had this discussion on that. I don't like to invest in businesses that will only be successful if they take in three million bucks. And there's some companies like that. There's other companies that say, well, if you don't invest, I sell like this. If you do invest, we explode. Oh, I like that a lot. Um, but that perfect investment, as you can already start to see, is going to be a little different per person. But I think the three of us kind of agree on, you know, sort of a 10x return, three, four years. I mean, if you do it in two years, I don't think anybody will complain. Uh, <laughs> And with a good exit, because we don't get our money out any other way. So it's got to, you got to get out of it. Could, could that exit be pertaining to a single product in the product line, not the whole, necessarily the whole company? If someone wanted, like if Google wanted to come in and buy one of your products um, in, a, instead of your whole company, I don't know if that. So as an investor, I've invested in your whole company, right? Right. And, but you, and might you manage to only sell off a piece of it at 10x, so then the whole company is worth even more than 10x? Yeah, I wouldn't mind that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if presenting your exit strategies, um, you know, that is one of the formulas that I, might I think it gets, and this is like a, per, remember we said earlier that it's very personal when you talk to that angel investor, but I think when you start to chop up your company, <clears throat> I think if you sold to Google, you'd sell all the products, but maybe not, you're right. Um, sometimes it just, you know, you want to keep it simple. Um, if I make sense. Oh, sometimes, sometimes I'll get a, a, an opportunity, um, and the entrepreneur is very excited. He's I've got all these ideas. I'm gonna make this one happen, and then I'm gonna make this one happen, right. and that. That's a total distraction. I get turned off. Yep. Because I want all the blood, sweat, and tears going into focus. Right? I mentioned focus before going all in one general direction. That's really what I'm investing in. When he says, look at everything else I can do, I get just, I just I get turned off. There's other opportunities where a company says, you know, I, I'm owning the company right now and I've got this great idea and I want to spin it off. And that's what I'm trying to raise money for. Okay, that's a turn off. Because that individual, who are they really concentrating on? Are they concentrating, or, or what are they concentrating on? Is it that company they're concentrating on? Or if this company runs into problems, they're gonna jump ship. Or better yet, are they trying to raise money for this opportunity to bail out that opportunity, you know, that current business? So it, it, it gets confusing, a little bit complicated. So the, the best thing to do is you have one individual with one product, one focus. But as you grow the business, right, you start expanding different in different same core competency, but in different, perhaps different applications or different areas. Um, and for a matter of time, I'd like to do Christian. You're really great at this on the fly. Can I can just add the last comment oh, because okay. I think somebody earlier also brought it up that I think when it comes to getting funding, right? And I always tell people, think of it as getting help for your company. Don't think of it as just getting dollars. So at the end of the day, figure out what the money's for, what you need to do with it, and other creative ways to get it. Right? It's not just about going to angel groups. Do you need the money so you can hire a technology person? Maybe you could give a technology person equity. As an angel, I'd love to see somebody who's made a few deals for equity before they come for just the money. Do you need PR? Can you go to a PR firm and give them some equity for some work? Whatever you think in writing. Um, do you need you know, a technology built so you go to a tech firm? My old company, Rosetta, we used to make equity deals for you know partial equity, partial cash all the time. Start doing less when we weren't getting our 10x return, but we used to make deals like that all the time. Uh, you need legal help, you need an accountant. People like to see I've got these people helping me, uh, these people are dedicating you know, three hours a week to my thing, and I'm giving them one or two percent equity. To me, it shows that you're a deal maker, and that's a huge part of running a small business. Okay. Um, now, really quickly, what a, a really quick business off the fly. You have to just like, you know, 
Give an example. Oh, I don't know. You know, I knew you were going to ask me. And I don't want to use the same one I did last time. Like, oh, wow. He did this last time. Um, I was trying to do one really off the fly, so I think I, it was really I just thought of one this morning. Everyone talked about. I'm, I'm stealing. Okay. I'm stealing. I'm going to put it out there. So we run a waste management company that takes waste from various restaurants and garbages in the area. We actually apply a special process that we have with worms that completely eliminates the waste. And with that, we're making $15,000 a day. We're able to build in a standard community so we don't have any uh, special environmental protection issues. And we're going to patent this idea. Well, we've already patented this idea. And we're selling it to various municipalities in the area. Only, only, and we all know that uh, I just saw Olive and I said, you know, I think yeah. I can do this. Was I, was I close? Not too bad. <laughs> I figured I had to challenge myself. Um, and just, I should have talked about the money more. Kind of, uh, wrap okay. it up a little bit. Um, I want to you briefly introduce Olive and then I would just like one example of a business that you guys, you heard the pitch. What made you meet with the, with the entrepreneur that you ultimately ended up investing in the business, okay? So Olive, why don't you stand up? This is Olive Lynch. She was the last Charbet Tank winner from our conference. And go ahead, Olive. So, so my elevator speech is really quick. I say I basically recycle food waste into biofuel and protein meal using fly larva. And the potential upside is making $180 a ton. And if I'm successful, it'll be changing the industry because my current competition basically are landfills, composters, and biodigesters. And all of those business models depend on tipping fees for profitability because their end products are not worth that much. It's basically compost. By producing biofuel and protein meal, there's actually value. So my business model down the road when it's fully mature would be I would charge zero tipping fee which is what would change the industry. And there'd be all this value. Um, and it's a whole thing of renewable energy and also replacing fish meal and agricultural and aquaponics feeds from, instead of using fish meal, you could use the warm meal. So that's the basic core business. I joined Own Adventures. I did the Shark Tank, which believe me, you go in there, your heart's pounding, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. But it was really, it was a wonderful exercise because to say your pitch and what you're going to do and be focused, it sharpens your your goals. And just like we were talking about, you're focused on what you have to do. You know what your, your mission is. There's a million details, but you don't need to tell people that unless they want to hear the full story. So I did the Shark at Tank, and what that le then led to is I did the New Jersey Venture Association pitch. I came in seventh, and basically, they said I wasn't fundable because I was still too early stage. You know, I'm the seed stage. I'm planning to actually start operations next year because I've been going through a lot of you know regulatory things that I have to go through. Then that led to I did the Woodbridge Business Green Business Plan competition. I won it. I won $7,500 in a year's worth of consulting. So one thing led to the other, and it's each time you know people would talk to me afterwards and you know give you feedback. You get an idea and you go, okay, where did I mess up or where did I stumble or where. Where wasn't I as clear as I could have been, you know? Or, so the whole thing is it's the practice, it's the networking, it's meeting people. You know, that's all really valuable. And the big thing I would say that I know I have a big idea, so I am building that team. I have two attorneys. One's helping with real estate. Liz's firm is helping me with the patents I'm going to be filing. I've got an engineer. I've, I'm actually getting ready to hire a garbage waste, food waste recycling garbage expert because Literally, I'm going to have to start my own little hauling company because none of the haulers will deal with food waste at the volumes I need to start out with. So, and I'm, I'm adding people as I go because you have to, you know. So, being an entrepreneur in the beginning, yes, I'm I'm doing the work. I mean, this past summer I raised 200 pounds of barb in my bathroom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, but the goal is is that if you're going to build a company, it's about delegation. And like, I know what I'm really good at, and my what I think I'm good at is seeing the vision, knowing all the details, and then assigning it to people to do that work for me. Or I help them or work in conjunction with them. So I that's 
for me where I'm, I think I'm to the point that I've made all the right decisions. And when I launch in the spring, which is my target goal to launch, it's then about two years of ramping up, proving that this thing works on a commercial scale. There are other people doing this. There's actually probably about three or four organizations throughout the world that are researching this because it has such potential, but no one has gotten to a commercial stage yet. So in that sense, I feel a sense of urgency that I want to get there first. <laughs> you know, but but it, there's worldwide interest. In fact, I've called Liz because I've gotten calls from China. You know, people interested in the whole, tell us about what you do. Oh, let's do a collaboration. And I'm like, eh, no. <laughs> yeah, so you have to be careful, too. If, if what you're doing is so new or you have a special way of doing it, you know, there are people out there that want to know it and you need to protect yourselves. And I think I'm kind of an open person. I want to tell everyone everything, but I've learned to be very kind of closed. I'll tell generalities and I'll just say, go on the web and you can research it. You know, that, that kind of thing, because there's a lot of information out there. So, so that's and Olive's company is Green Waste Technology, Green Waste Technology. Yeah. and um, it's just it's been really an honor to watch oh. you like going and I, I, I every time I talk to an investor they're like okay is Olive going yet yeah. because they want people want to get in involved yeah. with what you you're know, doing. What I'm doing is very highly regulated. I, I have to get licensed by the DEP and the, I'm going after an R D and D which is research development demonstration. I had to go to the city council and get a resolution to support it. I had to have meetings with the air quality DEP people because they could come in and make you spend you know, a million dollars on an air system, but they agreed that they'll just give me like a certificate because we'll let you gather data. I'm like, okay, good. You know, which means I don't have to spend money. You know? So there's a lot of things I've been doing to get ramped up to this point. Mm -hmm. Just finding a location took almost a year because I go to a landlord and say, well, I'm going to have food waste and flies. And they all go, ah! And then, you know, so I found a landlord, but it's been very difficult working with him, but we're to the point that, you know, we're going to have everything dealt with and I'll be able to actually start. And in a way, waiting the time that I've had to wait has given me time to do more networking, do more research. I've refined things further. Um, what I do all the time, the whole thing, I'll do a plug. I did the ETI class with the UDC, UDC EDC, and that was very helpful because Doing a business plan helps you, again, narrow, uh, narrow down what you have to do, but I constantly change it because I get new information, I research things, I add to my financials. I mean, I have projections out 10 years, you know, and I, I even calculate like employees, you know, help, I do everything because I want to prove to myself this is profitable. So when the time comes that I'm ready for investors, which I believe it's going to be about a two year period, that I will know where where I can offer them the value, but that I can use that money when I really need to use the money. So, you know, which is the, the big growth, you know. So, so that's Well, it. thank you. Okay, thank sure. you so much. <laughs> and, uh, I want to thank the panel really quick. An example of a business, what, what grabbed the attention and that you ultimately ended up uh, investing. The the business in is uh, Speech Trans. Two young kids uh, came into the group. They were enthusiastic, they were inspiring, uh, they had a presentation, but they also had a demonstration. They said, look, speak into this iPhone, so you speak English, uh, you speak French, you get English out. You speak Italian, you get English out. You speak Italian, you get English out, okay? We were just overwhelmed, not overwhelmed, but just inspired by their enthusiasm, great idea, and we've invested. Now they're looking at a Motorola and an HP deal. Very good. Good. Thank you, Mario. Liz? Uh, I was trying to think of one. Um, I'd say there was a uh, company that presented a couple years ago. They already uh, had the enthusiasm of another angel group um, behind them. And so once again, there was the referral. They were experienced industry executives. And they had a uh, both a green and a <coughs> um, you know money efficacy uh uh, take at the packaging industry, uh, packaging for things like uh, potato chips. There's four layers of packaging, and the issue is biodegradable, can oxygen permeate through it, so they were cheaper, it was clear packaging, it less, le less oxygen through, which kept the potato chips um, crisper for a longer period of time, so it increased shelf life, and it was green, you know, completely biodegradable, and um, between the endorsements we had from other people and the industry experience, we invested in them. The sales cycle ended up to be a problem. 
Um, but they are now moving forward and raising some more money, and we are still optimistic that it will come out well. Wonderful. Thank you. Liz. And, uh, you know, just from, from me, I like to get more involved in the companies I work with, whether it's for equity uh, or for you know, time or whatever. But I'll give you an example of we had a company that came in, Ticketly, and they're in the ticketing industry. Um, I have a background, one of the companies that I helped foul was Live Audience Business Solutions, where we did a lot of reporting for the ticketing industry. So again, I, I, I understood the business a little bit. The guy presenting was pretty much talking my language. And for me, it was very easy. He did, I think, a fantastic job of showing, you guys are getting in right here. And I believed everything he, he said. He a hockey stick on he, Yeah, he actually, I think he actually had a hockey stick. Yeah, he does. Um, yes. So we cut him a check. And that was, although it's interesting because all three of ours are still waiting, right? Well, the three I that we a, mentioned. I had a successful story. No, no, I know you do, but the three that we brought up, <laughs> yeah, are yeah, yeah, all still, still so yes. still I think waiting. somebody asked earlier still that waiting. a lot of angel investing is, you know, waiting. we pray one level higher to get, you know, the angel thing back. <laughs> well, Christian, thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Jasmine, thank you very much. Um, we're going to get going on the, the media panel. If we need a little break, I would recommend doing that while we switch on out. And Olive, thank you. Hope to see you in March. Olive.